Coming up, how Christmas is getting Scrooged. A Joe McScrooge it, armed with an attorney is quite dangerous. We talked to Sarah Palin about the culture wars. And in that battle that's brewing is those who would want to take God out of our society. And why Christians need to stand up. They don't have to hide their faith. They don't have to be um, embarrassed by it. Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this edition of the 700 Club. Man, it is cold, it is rainy, it is sleeting, it is freezing rain. And here where we are in Virginia Beach, it's a little island of calm and warmth <laughs> and joy. Be careful what you say. It's coming our way. <laughs> well, it ain't here yet. All right. But up in Richmond oh and beyond, the, the Virginia Highway Department of Spokesman said, historic ice, ice storm in Virginia and down in Texas is just monstrous. Yeah, really, the large portions of the United States are just experiencing incredible, terrible weather. It's shut down flights from Texas to the northern U.S. with the Philadelphia airport getting more snow than it had all of last year. Caitlin Burke has the story. Days after blasting areas across the Midwest and South, that massive winter storm is still going, now wreaking havoc on the East Coast. West Virginia saw three to six inches of snow early Sunday morning. And as this video from the CBN Washington Bureau shows, the nation's capital is waking up to its first snow accumulation of the season. Sleet and freezing rain are causing some big problems for people on the roads. This 50-car wreck outside of Philadelphia is responsible for one death. And near Milwaukee, a 30-car crash injured dozens and shut down Interstate 94. It was bad, like you could barely see out the road. Things start getting slick, everyone starts slowing down, and then bounce, 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 it's like bumper cars. Transportation officials say the best thing to do is to stay off the roads, but they're working to make this morning's commute as safe as possible. We want to make sure that we get a lot of salt, continue it down, so the morning rush hour is going to be smooth for people going to work and for school. The ice is also shutting down air travel. Airlines grounded more than 2,700 flights on Sunday, and more than 1,000 have been canceled for today. We just keep getting delayed, and for a lot of people, they're super upset. I'm as close to starting to begin to be frustrated here. The National Weather Service says the snow, sleet, and ice should pass by the end of today but cold temperatures will remain. And that's bad news for those without power. Falling tree limbs have knocked out hundreds of power lines, and utility providers say it could take days to get them back up. Caitlin Burke, CBN News. Wow. Aren't you glad you live in the Winter those? is upon us. <laughs> oh, we're here in Virginia Beach. Everybody should move to Virginia Beach. We don't have bad weather here. We have Decent traffic, too. Don't invite it. Oh, yeah. Well, the <laughs> traffic's horrible. And if you have about an eighth of an inch of snow, it freaks all these drivers. Yes, <laughs> they don't know does. how to drive in that. But anyhow, it's, um, whew, man, what about this global warming? There's supposed to be global warming. This is, they say for the next 30, 40 years, we're going to have global cooling. Well, what's the deal? I think it's begun, perhaps. <laughs> you think it's begun? All right. Well, if you're dreaming of a white Christmas, you got it. <laughs> you All right. Go. Well, one of the men who helped create the Democrats' new health care law now has a new explanation for one of his biggest failures. John Jessup has that story from Washington. Here's John. Pat, an architect of Obamacare, says if you want to keep your doctor under the new health care law, you can. You'll just have to pay more. That's how Dr. Ezekiel Emanuel explains the president's failed promise that Americans could keep their doctors under Obamacare. He told Fox News Sunday Americans didn't understand what the president really meant. The president never said you were going to have unlimited choice of any doctor in the country you the, want to go. I, if you want to pay more for an insurance company that covers your doctor, you can do that. This is a matter of choice. We know in all sorts of places you pay more for certain, for a wider range of choices or a wider range of benefits. Emanuel added no one ever guaranteed insurance premiums wouldn't go up. Pat, I doubt that explanation he offers is going to sit well with most people. I know a liar when I see one, and it's all over his face. 
and he is the architect of this ungodly law, and he's got to defend it. And the president is jetting off to South Africa to mourn over Nelson Mandela, but he ought to be at home mourning over what the wreckage he's made to our economy. John? Pat, eight major technology companies are calling on President Obama and Congress to put tighter controls on government surveillance. The companies include Apple, Microsoft, Facebook, Google, Twitter, Yahoo, America Online, and LinkedIn. The letter says they understand governments have a duty to protect their citizens, but they add the government surveillance, or rather that government surveillance, now has too much power, writing the balance in many countries has tipped too far in favor of the state and away from the rights of the individual, rights that are enshrined in the Constitution. The businesses are worried that people think what they do online can't be kept private. South Africans are preparing for the memorial celebration for Nelson Mandela. More than 50 heads of states are expected to attend, including President Obama and President George W. Bush. Former Presidents Bill Clinton and Jimmy Carter will travel there separately. Sunday was a national day of prayer for the anti-apartheid leader who became South Africa's first black president. It was marked by grief and celebration as churches and houses of worship across South Africa offered prayers and song. Both young and old are remembering his legacy. I'm here to celebrate the life of Madiba and that he fought for us for freedom. If it wasn't for him, we wouldn't be here. The memorial for Mandela will be held Tuesday. His body will lie in state from Wednesday to Friday. And Pat, one senior diplomat in South Africa told the Daily Mail that this is going to be the biggest state funeral since Winston Churchill. Well, I don't doubt that. Mandela was an extraordinary man. He was persecuted. He was put into mines where uh, the tear ducts that were, closed, were closed up because of the dust. He never lost his magnanimity. He was just an amazing man. His book was an extraordinary triumph of reconciliation. And uh, he was a leader uh, of his people. But, you know, along the way, the ANC flirted with communism. He was a radical. He, the reason he was in prison was because he had conspired to overthrow the government of South Africa. I was with President P.W. Bota, uh, who was the president of South Africa, and he told me that he was going to release Mandela and move him into his private, a private residence uh, in that same compound where he was being held. And that... I had that story, broke the story, and uh, it was the lead on the BBC News that night. That was a big thing, but uh, the apartheid government of South Africa realized that it couldn't uh, endure in its state as it was. And then Bota's successor, de Klerk, uh, said, look, well, we're going to make a deal. And uh, he, he made a, a, a accommodation with Mandela. Mandela then later ran, was elected president of the country, and was a symbol for the whole world of oppressed people. So I join millions who mourn his passing. He was a great man, a great symbol. But uh, I think we've got to be careful when we invest rebel leaders uh, with the aura of sainthood. I think he was a wonderful human being, but I, I don't know whether... Uh, we're not going a little too far in some of the, uh, well, the encomiums that are being uh, uh, heaped on him. But nevertheless, a great man, a great leader, and a world figure for reconciliation and, uh, well, mercy. It's, a, it's an amazing, amazing legacy. And uh, uh, if you haven't read it, you ought to read his book. It's, it's a tremendous book. And uh, what he did is wonderful. And so we honor him and uh, mourn his passing. John? Pat, here at home, Satanists are fighting to put up a monument on the Oklahoma State House steps. Republican lawmakers in Oklahoma approved a Ten Commandments monument for the State House back in 2009. Now a spokesman for the New York-based Satanic Temple is trying to donate a statue to go next to those commandments. Spokesman Lucian Greaves says putting up the commandments opened up the public space for his group, too. He's planning to submit possible designs soon, including one monument that displays a satanic pentagram. Well, a rare sight could be seen for much of the fall in the center of the nation's capital. 
42 straight days of worshiping bursting forth from a white tent just a few hundred yards from the White House. Paul Strand visited the temporary structure called David's Tent as it wrapped up a thousand hours of worship. David's Tent started as a vision last year of worshipers from all over the nation gathering somewhere in Washington, D.C. to praise their God without ceasing for 40 days and nights. But these ministers of music had never planned to end up right on the White House ellipse within eyesight and earshot of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, just about as close to the center of secular world power as one can get. The National Park Service actually suggested to us the White House ellipse. And so we just felt like through that whole circumstance that God was screaming at us, I want to be central in America. Park Service people helped the David's Tent worshipers to be here again this year, and they've already greased the skids for next year when Hershey and friends plan to take it up a notch. We really feel like God said 50 days, one day for every state. I've already met with the National Park Service and they've already given me the preliminary permitting for 50 days next year. Alexandra McDonald came all the way up from the Virginia Beach area to serve and to sing here. The Lord has really marked this, this event, this David's Tent this year with peace and a lot of favor with the Secret Service, with the park, uh, park police. We'll have, every day we'll have a uh, Secret Service agent come up here and, and we'll get to pray with them. Just, it's, it's, it's so crazy. Alan Avery is a regular among the worshipers. He believes there's real transforming power in the praise. I believe it does change and shift atmospheres. And that's what we're here to do. We're, we're saying God's presence, wants, God's presence wants to invade, you know, us. Washington, D.C., our world, our state, our nation. Avery says many believers come by, but plenty of non-believers, too, pulled in by the sweet presence hovering over the place. They just love it. They just love the worship because worship brings people in. And I just believe God's presence is so strong that he can, he can minister to people's hearts whether they know him or not. And some have come to know him at David's tent, one in an extraordinary way. One of our girls one night chased somebody down on the ellipse as they were walking away, chased him down, pulled him back, witnessed to him, he came back the next night and gave his life to Jesus. Now the David's Tent worshipers want to transform not just individuals, but a city, maybe a nation. We're just praying, saying, God, help us mobilize the nation next year, that a national call could go out, that this, literally this city could be redefined and known for a place to gather and praise the name of the Lord. So as these folks wrap up their second year and prepare to return for a third, their goal is that Washington won't only be known as the world's most powerful city, but as a place where the nation comes to praise its God. Paul Strand, CBN News, the White House. A congressional hearing on the plight of American pastor Saeed Abedini is set for Thursday morning in Washington. Members of Congress will hear from Pastor Saeed's wife, Nagme, and Jordan Seculo of the American Center for Law and Justice. Pastor Abedini was transferred last month to the violent criminal ward in Rajashar prison, the deadliest prison in Iran. He has been repeatedly robbed and threatened at knife point there and his health is declining since Iranian authori authorities won't give him his medication. He's malnourished and covered in lice. You can find out what the American Center for Law and Justice is doing and what you can do to help Pastor Abedini by going on to our website at cbnnews.com. Pat, last year I interviewed Pastor Abedini's wife and she told me that Jesus gives her the grace and strength to be a single mom and fight for her husband's release. Well, it breaks your heart, and the fact that they do this, that they stick their finger right in their eyes. I mean, this man's an American citizen. Sure, he's born an Iranian, but he's an American citizen. And for them to treat him this way and uh, deny him medicine, I mean, how barbaric can you get? What's he done? The only offense is that he believes in Jesus Christ. They say, well, he's, he's spreading Christianity. Well, yeah, sure he is. And for that, he's going to be locked up in prison and allowed to die. I think it's time that we really, and, and yet we're having a, a little uh, love fest with the Iranians that are releasing uh, sanctions so that they can have more money and build more centrifuges. I mean, I, it's, it's, it's totally irrational, our dealing with the Iranians. Terry? Well, coming up, Sarah Palin is on a mission to put the Christ back in Christmas. The road that we are on today is too many of those angry atheists armed with attorneys would try to take away that freedom to express faith. Well, it's going to end in ruin unless we do something about it. The former vice presidential candidate unloads about the war on Christmas when we come back.
In 2008, my husband Gary departed for heaven. I was still grieving. And then to find out I had cancer, I began praying, God, how do I do this? Where do I do this? Cancer Treatment Centers of America was the place. Dr. Neelam outlined a plan that would take care of my mind and my body, and she prayed with me. For Bible-believing Christians, we're able to pray with them in a much deeper way as they begin to really rely upon their faith. At Cancer Treatment Centers of America, we believe in the power of faith and prayer as indispensable allies in the fight against complex and advanced stage cancer. I'm back in Telluride on the mountain skiing. I feel strong and healthy. Advanced medicine and technology. And I am a survivor. The warm embrace of the spirit and the power of prayer. These are happy tears. Please go to cancercenter.com forward slash faith. Appointments available now. Cancer Treatment Centers of America, care that never quits. Tuesday is America an Islamic country? This Homeland Security Advisor thinks so. How the Muslim Brotherhood infiltrated our government. Plus, when I got in that car, didn't look back. A teen takes off for Christmas. I told him to take me anywhere but home. Find out what brings him back. Tuesday on the 700 Club. Well, in 2008, the governor of Alaska, Sarah Palin, made history. She was the first Republican woman as a candidate for vice president. Today, she's not on the campaign trail, but she's still in the spotlight. Now she's right in the middle of the battle to protect the heart of Christmas. Our David Brody sat down with Sarah with this story. In a way, it's like 2008 all over again. Hundreds of East Texans lined up for hours this morning. It was a fan frenzy outside Barnes & Noble. Even though it's been five years since Sarah Palin ran for vice president, her fans still can't get enough of her. This has been one of my dreams come true. So she's just a wonderful person inside and out. So this has been a highlight of my life. It's history and making. The hoopla is over Palin's new book called Good Tidings and Great Joy, Protecting the Heart of Christmas. Palin tells CBN News that the book is a rallying cry for Christians to stand up against those who want to keep faith out of the public square. We were founded as written in our charters of liberty and the documents that created America. We're founded on a, a Judeo-Christian faith that would allow forever the right to express our respect for faith in America. Palin says those rights are under attack from atheists, and she has a name for them in the book. Joe McScrooge. How dangerous is someone like a Joe McScrooge to America? That's a great question because a, a Joe McScrooge it, armed with an attorney is quite dangerous. Indeed, each year stories like this constantly make the news. Just recently, a Colorado school stopped its association with Operation Christmas Child after atheists threatened to sue. Same thing in Alsip, Illinois where the small town stopped putting up its annual cross on the water tower for fear of a lawsuit. The road that we are on today is too many of those angry atheists armed with attorneys would try to take away that freedom to express faith. Well, it's going to end in ruin unless we do something about it. And that's where the fight comes in. Palin, who knows a thing or two about adversity, tells Christians not to be intimidated. I want this book to be a call to action to take steps for school districts, for communities, for business owners, for families to, to understand. They don't have to hide their faith. They don't have to be um, embarrassed by it. Palin adds this isn't just about fighting lawsuits. This war on Christmas is really the tip of the spear when it comes to a greater battle that's brewing, and that battle that's brewing is those who would want to take God out of our society, out of our culture, which will lead to ruin, as history has proven. Palin also sees big government as part of the problem and makes it clear that includes the Obama administration. To tell you the truth, David, I don't know what they're doing right. She keeps her message out there as a Fox yeah, News well, contributor. Her political action committee is loaded with supporters and money to burn in the upcoming 2014 midterm elections. And candidates still seek her endorsement. 
She hits the road in important political states like Iowa, preaching constitutional conservatism. The crowning achievement of their church of big government, Obamacare. But Palin isn't interested in just taking on this president. Her heart is for a better America, a place where people can express their faith freely. In the book, she says without a faith in Christ, she wouldn't have been able to stand through those very tough times when she ran for vice president. There is no way I would be standing if it weren't for that faith that, um, you know, I had adopted as as a kid, um, asking Christ into my life, putting my hand, my life in his hands, saying, God, you're my creator. I, I, I've got to believe that you know more about uh, destiny than I do. So, you know, heaven forbid I try to orchestrate it myself. Lord, I'll, I'll, send me, I'll, I'll go. David Brody, CBN News. It's a nice piece. She doesn't quite know what to do these days, I think. She's looking for a cause. Well, that's uh, a cause worthy of its... Yeah, it is, but I'm telling you, I, I, I wish you the best because... If any human being was beat up by the media, oh, she was the butt of every joke. But she's she comes back. Oh, she's she tough as, back, a, as, as she's, she's a fighter. Okay. Well, you don't have to worry about the 700 Club whitewashing the religious aspects out of Christmas. Up next, one wise man investigates the star of Bethlehem, while another tells us what really happened in that stable the night Jesus was born. So don't go away. Good news and bad news. Today, millions of Americans are fearful of the direction our great nation is headed, slowly crushing the middle class, rising taxes, falling wages, rising debt, failing trust. Experts say the era of public trust in debased money is ending. But since the dawn of creation, gold has protected wealth from the foolishness of men and out of control governments. One asset class is worthy of your trust, precious metals. Gold and silver transcend every language, religion, and culture. Gold is true money, while paper money and government debt are IOUs. God only knows America's future, but this much I do know. Gold is trustworthy no matter what happens. Why don't you call my good friends at Swiss America, the experts on gold for over 30 years. Ask for their latest report and DVD free. You can trust gold. Call now. This is a special announcement for anyone with joint discomfort who's been disappointed by products that have failed to provide the relief they were seeking. Complimentary samples of a revolutionary joint relief breakthrough called Beneflex are now being made available to the public. The unique Beneflex formula contains a clinically tested patented ingredient that's so effective you only need to take one pill daily, just one pill, and you can begin to experience joint relief in as few as seven days. To guarantee your complimentary two-week sample, you must call now, 1-800-940-5957. Again, if you have joint discomfort and have been disappointed by products currently available, complimentary samples of a powerful new quick joint relief formula are being made available to the public. To guarantee your sample, you must call now. Beneflex is available at GNC and Vitamin Shop, but you can only receive your complimentary sample by calling this number, 1-800-940-5957. Well, we're coming up on Christmas, and unless the uh, Christmas Scrooges have gotten to it, nativity displays can be seen all around the world, especially you go to Asia, you go to Japan, you go to China, you go to the Philippines. Huge Christmas. But no matter the shape, size, or form, they feature the Christmas basics. Wise men, shepherds, Mary, Joseph, and baby Jesus in a manger. But is that depiction accurate? Ooh, Wendy Griffith talked with author Ace Collins for his take on it. Ace, I just love nativity scenes, and this one in front of us reminds me so much of the one that we had in my house growing up as a child. When did people start displaying nativity scenes? They probably started making carvings in the third or fourth century, but the first nativity scene that we really look at is beginning what we look at today 
was started by Francis of Assisi about eight centuries ago. He used them as teaching tools. As a matter of fact, he incorporated live animals and actors and even had songs. It was part of an hour or two hour long pageant, if you will, where he brought the manger scene to life for the very first time so people could really understand what happened on that first Christmas night. Now the night that Jesus was, was born, we know he was born in a manger. How accurate is a nativity scene like this one? We honestly don't know. We know that there had to be animals because the city was full and people brought the animals in. They were probably inside the stable, not on the outside. We do know the shepherds arrived. One of the things that we also know is the magi, the visitors from the east, the kings, did not come to the manger, they even though we always see them. The they came many, many months later and visited Mary and Joseph in their home and spent the night with them. So we know that most of the nativity scenes are not accurate, but I don't think that is as important as it is to realize that probably more than anything else, these little nativity scenes put the focus back on the reason for the season. And it really shows us that God came to us as a common man so that we could all relate to him. Well, thank you, Ace. We have, as a tradition in our family, uh, we have Christmas Eve, a big dinner, and then we read the Christmas story. And after we do that, we all gather around a crash that came from my wife's family, and I think it may have been her parents' parents. I'm not That's sure. It goes wonderful. back a long time. Anyhow, and the youngest of the group puts the little baby Jesus in the little in the manger, in the little manger and it's real sweet. And then we sing something like Silent Night. It's all it's kind of nice. So That's it, it, wonderful. Yeah. That's, we collect crashes from around the world, yeah. which is kind yeah. of a fun thing, too. And, Beautiful. and it's the center of our celebration as well. Well, so the three wise men didn't quite make it to the manger the night that Jesus was born. In fact, there's really no proof that there were only three of them. Here's what we do know. They traveled many, many miles to Bethlehem because something remarkable appeared in the sky. And recently, one professor resolved to find out exactly what that was. For centuries, scientists, historians, and Bible scholars have studied the stars. Many believe there are messages in them. One of the most significant for Christians and Jews was the Star of Bethlehem, which foretold the birth of Christ. Some scholars have argued whether this star was genuine or a legend created by the early church. In his documentary, The Star of Bethlehem, Rick Larson unlocks this heavenly mystery by following clues from the Bible. Well, Rick Larson joins us now. Rick, welcome to the 700 Thank you so Club. Much. You're a law professor, not an astronomer. How did you get into this whole search? Isn't that crazy? Yeah. <laughs> you know, if you, if, you talk, if you talk to people who wind up in ministry, I think an awful lot of them will tell you they've been tricked. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> now, what happened to me is uh, my neighborhood had a, a community Christmas celebration where all the front yards went the same way. Uh huh. But it wasn't had nothing to do with Jesus. It was animals and presents and bunnies and stuff like Polar that, and we didn't and, do it. Yeah. So everybody did it except us, and when the time came and the kids were driving through <laughs> and looking at all the houses, ours was dark. And so they're saying, oh, look, Daddy, here's where the atheist lives, you know? <laughs> so being a Christian did not pan out that way. That so time, you needed to do something to fast, counter that, right? Fast, and it was like this year is so frigid. We had a frigid winter, and my daughter Mary and I, she was about waist high that time. We ran into the garage and made Weissman, huh? and we put him in the yard. And Marion started the whole thing when she said, Dad, we got the Wiseman. Don't we need a star? I said, yeah. I guess we do. So if I'm going to make a star, well, what was it? What did it do? Yes. How long did it last? Did it move? Yeah. Was it an angel? Was it the Shekinah glory of God? So I started the research, and that's what's changed my life. Well, talk a little bit about what it was. Some people say maybe it was a comet or some kind of other, you know, sign in the sky that was out of the ordinary. Yeah. For, what, what, what was it? Well, when I began the research, I was surprised at how many theories had been put out there. Uh -huh. And it makes you wonder. I'm a researcher by trade. It's a, I'm a lawyer. And so you, you think, you know, if everybody looks at the same evidence, shouldn't we arrive at somewhat similar results? Yes. But they're all over the deck. And I realized after looking at it closely the reason for that. And it's because they don't take the Bible very seriously. Yeah. If you go back to Scripture and you comb through Matthew with a fine-tooth comb, like uh, you're looking for every tiny clue, you can, you can carve out nine characteristics of the biblical star. Talk about some of those. So when you get those together, that means that we have a fair amount of data. And if you get experts talking about the nine points, well, then we can come to some conclusions. So some of the nine points are obvious. Uh -huh. They're easy. 
Because when uh, the Magi arrived, they asked this loaded question. They say, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? So that's three clues. Whatever they saw in the sky suggested to them kingship, birth, and the Jewish nation. Okay, that's easy. Mm -hmm. But some of the clues, you know, are a little bit more obscure. Um, for one, they saw the star when they were in the east. They traveled all the way to Jerusalem. Don't know where they came from. Don't know how they traveled. But if they were from Persia, if they came through the Fertile Crescent, we're talking about months. Yes. And they arrive in Jerusalem and they still see the star. Yeah. So it lasted over time. That's another clue, right? Um, and then, uh, so you could put all nine together though, you can start eliminating things. Things fall out. You can't, it can't be, you know, a shooting star if it lasts over time. Right, right? exactly. Uh, and then we look at the ancient uh, records and there are lots of other ways to make the study happen. But here's the thing that blows me away. Matthew is no scientist. <laughs> he, uh, yet he wrote his, his gospel and got nine points which happened, I mean, they're right there in the sky, precisely correlating with what he wrote down. He couldn't have known. This mm -hmm. is the Holy Spirit of God. So when he wrote his, his story, his account of the star, it would hold up to scientific scrutiny 2,000 years later when we're pressing it extremely hard. Mm -hmm. And it turns out, my goodness, there are things in the sky that precisely correlate with what he described. Yeah. Do you think everybody noticed this happening in the sky i mean it 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 signified to the shepherds as well where the stable was but at the same time the magi came months later i mean it, it did everybody notice it or just you know i i can't say everybody did i think probably not but i don't i do know the romans noticed it because they wound up putting it on a coin which is a longer story than we can tell here huh. but so the star of bethlehem actually appears on a roman coin um but uh, I think it was something that was noticeable, but understandable only when explained by experts. Mm -hmm. So while the people in Jerusalem may have seen something of interest, almost certainly did, um, when the Magi arrived and explained it all and put it in context, I think that's when it blew their minds. What are the odds of something like this happening? I mean, you've done some study now sure. on, on things that go on in the sky yes. and history of that. Well, you know, the solar system and the universe itself, is, it operates like a great clock. Everything's extremely regular. Unbelievably. And, and many events recur. Yeah. So if you take a series of events like Matthew describes, any one of those events might well happen again. Um, sometimes on short intervals, sometimes on much longer ones, and sometimes they seem to be aperiodic. You don't know when they will recur. Mm -hmm. But if you stack nine things up, you get reducing probability each time you add another improbable event. And so by the time you have nine, you have the recurrence, uh, uh, the likelihood becomes basically nil. And of course, it surrounds the birth of the one who claimed to be the, the Christ. Right. And so reproduction, right. it'll never happen again, put it that way. There, there also are some people who say that, uh, that all of this happened about two or three BC, and yet there are scholars who say that the death of Herod agree, occurred in 4 BC. Do you have any problem with those discrepancies or where do you go with that in your study? You know, when you're dealing with 2000 years ago and scholarship yeah. <laughs> at that distance, you're going to have difference of opinion. And um, of, yes, I would say probably the main line opinion is that Herod died in 4. And so obviously the star had to have happened before that. Yeah. Um, but I think the latest scholarship is counter to that. It, it tends to indicate that Herod died in 1 BC. And uh, there's a lot of excellent scholarship that's uh, the most recent out there. And, uh, and I'm convinced that they're correct. Uh, and so when if di Herod died in one, the, the right years to look for yeah, the star are two and three. Two and three, yeah. sure. And I try to put all that stuff linked on my website because there's a lot of scholarship behind that. If they go to Bethlehemstar.net, they can access that. Well, you have done some wonderful research and homework on all of this for us and put it together in a great DVD, The Star of Bethlehem, Unlock the Mystery of the World's Most Famous Star. What do you hope people will come away from after they watch this? I'm going to tell you that, but first, Terry, do you know what happened to that thing? What? I, knew, I mean, I knew it was going to be wonderful. That has been the top selling uh, documentary in the world. Really? No, no qualifications. Number one on Amazon. You think I have that screenshot? <laughs> Blew me away. You know, God has chosen really? to use this. God has chosen to use that thing. Um, when they take away from it will be a number of things. First of all, we all have got an Anthony, an Uncle Anthony, or, you know, or Susan, yes. or somebody we love, who if you say the name of Jesus, the ice wall goes up, and mm -hmm. that's that. Mm -hmm. But they like mysteries. Anyone will look at a in mystery. Fact. That's a great mm -hmm. mystery. In fact, it's historical, it's objective, scientific, but it's entertaining. Yes. Um, and it packs a spiritual wallop. It's like a Trojan horse. It's like yeah. the perfect thing to give somebody you love who doesn't want to talk about the Lord. Well, it's, it's a great time of the year to give it to them as well. Thank you so much for being with oh, us. I want to let you know you can check out the best-selling DVD. It's called The Star of Bethlehem. It's available nationwide. So Merry Christmas to all of you. Pat?
Thank you. Our uh, reporter, Galen Tethro, a couple of years ago, uh, did a study on the astrology of this. These so-called wise men were astrologers, and they, were, they had astrological significance to uh, what parts of the heaven these stars appeared in and why it was significant and how they knew it was the king of the Jews. It's very interesting. Well, still ahead, we're going to bring it on with your email. Nancy says, a friend asked me to pray because she was worried something bad was going to happen. I forgot to pray, and something bad did happen. Ooh, could she have avoided the situation if I remembered to pray? Well, we'll answer that question and more on today's 700 Club. This season, experience the true meaning of Christmas with Christmas Radio on CBN.com. Christmas, a time for being home with the ones you love. special time to help others. A time to celebrate the best gift of all, Jesus Christ. Cherish this holiday season with the ones you love. Experience Christmas Radio on CBN.com. Cell phones are great, but the amount some companies charge is just crazy. Since Connie and I switched to Consumer Cellular, we both get everything we want and we're paying about half what we used to. Do I have to buy the whole basket? No. Hey, you old cheapskate. Hey, Jack. Why pay for more than you need, right? That's why I keep telling you, Consumer Cellular plans start at just $10 a month. And I'm finally ready. My contract's up. Oh, here's to the end of contracts. Yeah. Well, did you tell him how easy it is to switch? Well, of course I told him. It's really easy to switch. Okay. Consumer Cellular, simple plans with award-winning service and no contract. Start your 30-day risk-free trial today. Activation is free, a $35 value, and we'll ship it free. Or visit a Sears store today. And Consumer Cellular was selected as the exclusive wireless provider for AARP members. Ask about your special discounts. Call 1-800-460-7238. Go online to ConsumerCellular.com or visit a Sears store today. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. A Colorado judge says a Christian baker in suburban Denver has to make a wedding cake for a gay couple, even though the baker says doing that would violate his religious beliefs. The American Civil Liberties Union filed a case accusing the owner of the Masterpiece Cake Shop of discrimination. The judge says the baker will face fines if he turns away other gay couples despite his religious beliefs. The baker is considering whether to appeal. More than 3,000 children attended a CBN Kids event at a school in Cambodia. Some of them walked or rode bicycles long distances just to attend. The program featured hosts from CBN's Super Kids Club. And at the end of the event, more than 3,000 children filled out response cards confirming they prayed to receive Jesus. A local church that partners with CBN will follow up with the children and help them learn more about God. You can find out more about what CBN is doing around the world by logging on to CBN.com slash international. Pat and Terry will be right back right after this. If I can talk to anyone as much as I want to here, namaste, Ooh, masaledad. then why am I limited when I make international calls? Que pena. Exactamente, amiga. That's why we'll connect the world with one low rate for unlimited calls. So I can call China as much as I want? True that. And India? Ah! And I can call my girlfriend in Brazil. Claro! Over 60 countries. People thought we were crazy to give you unlimited long distance. Crazy, crazy generous! Feel free to talk at Phonics.com. Call now for your chance to win a one-ounce gold bar from Capital Gold Group by answering this question correctly. Which president took the United States dollar off the gold standard? Was it A, Ronald Reagan, B, Richard Nixon, or C, Franklin Roosevelt? All calls are free. Limit one entry per person. Call now with your answer for your chance to win a one-ounce gold bar. Call 800-385-GOLD. 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 
Tuesday, is America an Islamic country? This Homeland Security Advisor thinks so. How the Muslim Brotherhood infiltrated our government. Plus, but I got in that car, didn't look back. A team takes off for Christmas. I told them to take me anywhere but home. Find out what brings him back. Tuesday on The 700 Club. To see this week's top on-demand videos, go to CBN.com. Well, it's time to answer some of your email questions on today's program. Pat, this first one comes from Nancy, who says, Someone I know asked me to pray for them because, without getting into particulars, they were worried that something bad was going to happen to them. I said that I was going to pray, but I completely forgot. Sure enough, that bad thing happened to my friend. Now I feel horrible. Did I sin by not praying? Should I tell my friend that I forgot to pray and that she may have avoided her situation if I prayed? What should I do? Boy, you think your prayers have a lot of weight, don't you? I mean, <laughs> but, uh, you, you know, somebody needs prayer, and they ask for prayer, and you say, yeah, I'll pray, and then you didn't pray. I, yeah. I think God does hear our prayers. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I can't go into all the details. I don't have all the details. But um, I think we have a responsibility to uphold one another and to pray for one another. And if somebody says, I'm facing a difficult situation, pray for me, I think to deny them that, that support is, is really wrong. You say, did you sin? I don't know if it's a sin. But, uh, you know, I don't think she did it deliberately either. I've had that happen in my life where I've told someone I'll pray, and then you get busy and you go along. And I, I started to make the habit of stopping and praying right, right then, then because otherwise, you, you know, life it, happens. You know, yeah. I've had people say, you know, we'll pray for my mother. All right, let's do it right now. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, now. Absolutely. And I'm then, with you. All right. But okay. Okay. This is Laura who says, I've heard you talk about how Christians will be here during the tribulation. I've heard a pastor say that there will not be a second chance for sinners during the tribulation and that those who aren't Christians when it starts are going to hell. What do you think? Oh, uh, I don't know. The, the Bible is very expensive about that. Uh, the, the clearly, when the Lord comes back, He's going to rapture people, catch them up to be with Him. He's going to send His angels and gather elect from the four corners of the earth. That's what the Bible says. Uh, we look at so-called pre-millennial, looks at the fact that there's going to be a thousand years of peace. Mm -hmm. uh, there are many things that are in the Bible that are veiled. We don't know what they are. Uh, so, I think if there's a tribulation problem, if there's an antichrist, uh, there's going to be a time of massive delusion. And those who take the mark of the beast are going to be sucked up into this system, just like there was mass delusion in Germany under the Nazis. These wonderful people that brought forth Beethoven and Bach and Brahms and Handel, these same people were willing to slaughter the Jews and, and give power to this monster, Adolf Hitler. There was a collective confusion. That will happen under an antichrist system. So to say they can't get saved, well, sure, there's always somebody who can come to the truth. So I, I don't think that's the case. But I do think that the chance of delusion is very strong during a period of like that. Mm -hmm. This is Rachel who says, can someone haunt you after you die? No. I don't believe in all this haunting stuff. I don't believe in ghosts and goblins and all it's that. Over. I believe in evil spirits. And I do believe that there are demonic, unclean spirits. The Bible talks about them, and there's no question about it. Um, but uh, I think that uh, somebody is going to die and then come back and haunt you. No way. I don't believe yeah. that. I think that's superstition. And it's, it's not biblical. Mm -hmm. All right. This is Chasmar. This is an interesting question. He says, every night I pray for the suffering of those who may have lost the spiritual battle and are in hell for eternity. I realize that God does not make mistakes when he decides where people will spend the afterlife, but I can't help but think that people are being tortured with no hope. I ask God to somehow hasten their pain. Is it wrong for me to do that? And do you think it's even possible for it to happen? Um, you can waste prayers any way you want to. Yeah. But let me tell you, you're not going to change the destiny of those who died and are in hell. Yeah. The Bible teaches that very express, expressly. <clears throat> There's a great gulf between us fixed, 
and uh, they're suffering, and mm -hmm. it's just too bad. And Jesus said they've got Moses and they've got the prophets, and if they won't listen to them, they won't listen to somebody rose from the dead. So I, I think the idea of praying for the dead is, is just, it's nonsense. It's not going to have any effect. Mm -hmm. You say, well, if you want to spend your time doing it, you, you do it. It's probably better than wasting your time at, at, at uh, he Starbucks. He also says, I realize what? that God does not make mistakes when he decides where people spend the afterlife. We decide where we spend the afterlife by the choices exactly. we make. I'm Sure. Kind of, Good uh, word. This is Jane who says, I like my job, but my boss has left her child with me to essentially be her babysitter while she runs errands during the day. It happens all the time, sometimes for two hours at a time. I don't feel as if I should be responsible for her child, and I certainly feel she's abused our relationship. I would like to speak up and say something, but I'm afraid that if I complain, she'll tell me that I can quit if I don't like it. Do you think it's right? What's she paying you for? Is she paying <laughs> you to be a personal servant? Is she paying you to be a nanny? Or is she paying to be a, a salesperson? Yeah. What are you being paid for? If you're paying to, uh, to attend to her personal needs, and that's what you're getting paid for. So yeah. uh, take it. And what was your agreement? What was your mm -hmm. agreement? And, wh yeah. and wh what is your understanding? It does sound like if she's working for a corporation and she's using corporation money and corporation employees to do her personal business, then it's like stealing. That's a totally different matter, but you don't give me enough information to find yeah, out. Yeah, but she says it's, I, I think that this lady might own the business. Well, if she owns the business, then that's what she's her. paying yeah. you for. She wants you to take care of her kid. Mm -hmm. So if you don't like that, you got to quit. Go get yeah. another job. I agree. Okay. I'm glad you agree. I'm so happy. I'm so happy. Next Terry year. agrees. <laughs> That seals it. <laughs> there you go. All right. <laughs> well, when a baby boy was born in Guatemala, his entire village said he was cursed. His mother was afraid, and his father even wanted to let him die, all because of an unusual birth defect. By the time he turned two, a large tumor had grown on the back of Franklin's neck. His mother, Olivia, was shocked at how big it had gotten. I never thought that my baby be born with something like this. I thought he would die because of it. Villagers in this remote part of Guatemala thought the boy's condition had been caused by witchcraft. So every time Franklin's mother left their home, she was shunned by others. The people in the village said there was a curse on my family. Others just ran away when they saw me with the baby. It was hard for me. Olivia's husband told his wife to let their son die. When she refused, her husband abandoned them. He went away and never came back. I had to raise my baby alone. One day, Olivia learned about Operation Blessing and went to ask for help. After some tests, a doctor diagnosed the condition and scheduled free surgery for Franklin. I was so happy after my son had his operation. Two days later, they traveled back to their remote town. Everyone was surprised to see that the growth was gone. Soon, Franklin had recovered completely. Now, he goes out to play with all the neighborhood children, and Olivia knows her son is safe. I am so thankful for all the people and the doctors who made this miracle happen. Thanks, Operation Blessing. God bless you. Making a difference around the world. That's what 700 Club members are all about. Changing this little boy's life, removing his shame, giving him hope and a future. This is just one family, but this is happening in thousands and thousands of lives all around the world, whether it's food, clothing, medical care, water needs, uh, places to live. You are doing that, 700 Club members. And if you're not a 700 Club member, it's a great day to join. 65 cents a day, $20 a month makes you a club member, and we welcome Welcome you. I want to say also our way of saying thank you for caring about others is to send you Pat's latest teaching called How Shall We Now Live? It's an awesome teaching that's going to touch you. I want to share what Teresa said. I just watched the DVD of How Shall We Now Live? Amazed. I cried, smiled, agreed, felt excited, praise God. After watching it, I sent a thought for the day to my friends. She sent this quote from John 5, 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment but has 
passed out of death into life. My friend and co-worker who had a Christian friend in the care of hospice wrote back and stated how fitting that scripture was. Her friend had just passed away. What is so amazing to me is that my friend was the one who was heavy on my heart. And I felt the verse was needed at that very moment. I love how Jesus works. I'm filled with joy, peace, and love. Wanted to share with you what happened after watching the DVD. I'm so glad God laid it on Pat Robertson's heart to make the DVD. Truly inspirational. Well, Teresa, you're a blessing to me. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And this will be a blessing to, to others. So yeah, join now. We, we want to get this there, out There was an anointing there. It really was. It was up in the mountains of Virginia. And, and the, I, the wind was blowing and the fog was there. And the, mm -hmm. Great place to contemplate. Well, the, the, <laughs> Well, I'm going up there over Christmas, I mean, after Christmas. And That's wonderful. Do a little praying. But uh, uh, I, I really think the Lord touched us. It was a, it was a unique moment between Scott and me, and it mm -hmm. was good. Well, it's yours when you join the 700 Club, so call now. You know, they say it's better to give than receive, but do you know that you can do both at the same time? And we're going to show you how. That's next. This Christmas, share the ultimate life with someone you love, based on the best-selling novel. Your legacy is your family. The Ultimate Life, on Blu-ray and DVD tomorrow. With Basic Talk Home Phone Service, you can make unlimited, crystal clear domestic calls for just $9.99 a month, every month. But if you don't believe me, listen to this trustworthy grandfather. Yep, Basic Talk, just $9.99 a month. Call, click, or go to Walmart today. Well, 2013 is coming to a close, and so is the deadline for making charitable contributions that you can report on this year's tax return. The more you give, the more you can deduct, and the more money you get back from the IRS. Joining us now to explain is Frank Nico. He's CBS Director of Planned Giving. And Frank, it's good to see you okay. again. Thanks for being here. Good morning. All right, what are you telling people at this point? What's the key thing they should remember? Let's assume that they have bought some stock and the stock market has been real good this year and their stock's gone up. What do they do? Well, let me first mention last year when we talked in December at this time, we were faced, the, the economy was facing the fiscal cliff. And right. so the president and Congress, they agreed to pass the American Taxpayer Relief Act. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not a relief for a lot of the high income earners. There's four taxes that took place. There's an increase in the ordinary income tax from 35% to 39.6. Mm -hmm. Dividends and capital gains tax increased from 15 to 20%. Mm -hmm. Then there was the phase out of the personal exemption. And there was also the, they reinstituted the P's limitations or the provision which limits itemized deductions. And on top of that, the Affordable Care Act mm -hmm. imposed a 3.6% surtax on net investment income. So there are charitable strategies to counteract some of those tax increases, not only for the, you know, the high income earners, but mm -hmm. really they could apply to taxpayers in all the tax brackets. All right. Tell us. Okay. So for one of the strategies is giving appreciated stock. It's a double tax benefit. You uh, can give and get a charitable deduction for the market value, and also you bypass the capital gains tax on the appreciation. And so I have like an example. All right, go ahead. So like someone, let's say the stock market like this past year has gone up about 20%, and since mm -hmm. 2009, it's had a large increase. So if a few years ago you bought a stock for like $5,000 mm -hmm. and now it's appreciated to 10,000, mm -hmm. that generates a charitable tax deduction of 10,000 mm -hmm. and federal tax savings of like 3,960 for those in the top tax bracket. Besides, you bypass the capital gains tax, which would be 20% for the high income earner. So when you look at that for a gift of 10,000, you're talking about $5,000 tax savings right there. So you actually almost get your money back. Yeah. I mean, it's just a great strategy. I am a great fan of charitable remainder unit trust. Do you want mm -hmm. to talk about them? Well, charitable remainder unit trust, it, they're, they're great because you can set it up where you can create 
lifetime income or income for a term of years, but it's ideal for appreciated assets when, let's say, you have a business you're selling or you have real estate or rental property. Mm -hmm. And so the key is getting that trust set up first before you have any kind of legal binding contract. Right. Move that asset into the charitable trust. You get a charitable deduction and you bypass the capital gains tax. Well, if you've got some property that's not yielding much, or stock that isn't yielding much, for example, uh, you can put it into a charitable remainder unit trust and then reinvest it and get, and you can pay that money to yourself as right. a grantor, right? Right. Yeah, you can set it up as a percentage that you take out yeah. every year. And then the remainder, after one life or two life, it goes to the charity that you've picked. So it's, de it's deductible inside the, ch the unit trust, and the money that comes out you have to pay taxes on, but you can increase your, I mean, you can double or triple or quadruple the, the return on assets. Right. Right. And when you set that up, you mm -hmm. get a, the deduction at that time. So that's the good thing about oh, that. Off the top. Right. All right. Now, if they want to, uh, let's see, there's something else. Uh, if you have an IRA, and I have an IRA, well, most people have an IRA, uh, but this, uh, the law is very um, tough. If you get past 70 years old, you've got to start making a distribution from that IRA or else you get hit with a big penalty. All right. How do they give a, and, and, and avoid that penalty? Yeah. In, in fact, Pat, the penalty you're talking about, it's one of the most significant of all IRS penalties. It's 50% if you don't withdraw that for what, you know, you're scheduled to take. So one of the things that was actually reauthorized by Congress at the beginning of 2013 was the charitable IRA rollover. And so the benefit is that you can then take that distribution and will be tax-free. Mm -hmm. Now, the key is that that Payment has to be made from your IRA directly to the qualified charity like CBN. We've had a number of donors uh, that have participated in doing that charitable IRA. So a guy, he's got, he's got an IRA, right. and he can take as much as $100,000, pay it from the IRA to the charity, and he doesn't have any penalty. He's, he qualifies for the distribution he's supposed to make. And uh, he avoids all those penalties, and he can pass that money out to the charity with no, no strain, right? Right. And it's an exclusion from income, not a deduction. And so there's an added benefit in that, you know, it could affect lower, you know, since it's reducing your adjusted gross income, mm -hmm. it can actually reduce the Medicare premiums or the tax and Social Security benefits. So all those things come into play. All right, now, if somebody wants to do that and they're watching, listening to you with all this eloquence, what are they going to do next? Well, they can contact me all right. at 800-333-2373. But I also, for all these gift strategies, it's very important to consult their tax advisor and uh, concerning their own particular situation. Sure. All right, well, there's a different number on the screen you're used to seeing. It's 333, what is it? Three three seven three. It's three 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 two three seven three. Two three seven three. You got that? All right. And Frank Nico would love to talk to you, but this is a wonderful way of helping the Lord's work, and also saving some money, saving taxes, and in the case of the IRA, saving a penalty. That's right. Frank, thank you for being thank with you. us. He's there at your call. Here's a, a quick word for you. They put it on the screen. They took it down. The Power Minute. He who is generous will be blessed. For he gives some of his food to the poor. Well, that's all the time we've got for Terry and all of us. This is Pat Robertson, and we will see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. It felt like nothing at first, but then it started getting worse and worse. In like a week, it started to hurt. I saw pretty bad infection, so I kind of got upset and, and really scared. She thought it would, if I wouldn't do something about it, it would eat my toe off, literally. I record the 700 Club every day, so I was watching it, and I heard Terry say, There's someone, um, a parent, you're praying for a child named Timothy. God has heard your prayer, and the thing you've asked for will be done. And it was just such a personal word of knowledge. I just got really emotional. I thought that it would get healed in a couple of days, and I was really happy. But it turned out it got healed in a couple of hours, actually. I did see a change right away. 
I felt really good because I could run with mom on the jogging trails and I could do all the stuff that I wanted to do before.